a key point you make in the book is that if we look across cultures, this pattern of monogamy is clear. So I know all of us are bringing a cultural context to this conversation. And that cultural context could be religious influence based on the way we are raised, the communities we're a part of. You mentioned another culture, the elites. But I just want to point out that what is clear in the science is this pattern of monogamy in humans is prevalent across all cultures. Religion builds morality upon monogamy and the nuclear family in a lot of different instances of different religions completely. So there is a signal that is present in human nature that science is measuring across all of these cultures that leads to this conclusion of monogamy. Yeah, I, I think it's one of our great social achievements as a, as a human race. You know, biologists tell us that, that our, closest, our closest relatives biologically are, are chimpanzees and, and chimpanzees have Basically, they, they, they have sex indiscriminately. And, and so sometimes people point to that and say, well, you know, we're, we're just kind of like more advanced chimpanzees. One of the one of the things that we don't we often don't recognize how good we have it as human beings. Do, do either of you have just to guess if we applied our notion of, say, domestic violence to chimpanzees? Do you have any any estimate or guess at what proportion of female chimpanzees at some point in their lives experience what we would frame as domestic violence? Uh, nearly 100. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, and and you know, I would say that those those are linked, um, and you know, a lot of times violence is used by males to control, uh, you know, reproduction and, and reproductive access and so forth, and and you know, again, I I totally agree with you, AJ, that we ha we do have a deep capacity for for monogamy and and what you know anthropologists would call long term pair bonding. Um, we also have a capacity to not to kind of disregard that. I think it doesn't take long to look around the tabloids and see examples where, you know, people are behaving in, in, in other ways. It's obviously a sensitive issue. Um, I think it's going to be good for society. It's going to be good for children. It's, a, it's going to be good for women if we can continue on this uh, road, road toward monogamy. It's, you know, it, it's not easy, especially with some of the cultural changes that have happened in the last decades, at least in the West. But I think it's a, a fight worth uh, worth continuing. And, you know, it's in, in a sense, it's it requires us to overcome a, you know, a deep kind of propensity within within human nature to bring it home and, and to get back to this idea of, you know, what what actually is the purpose of existence? It to me, it seems that, look, the way that nature has shaped us leaves us pulled in these different directions, right? Um, you know, we have these differing capacities within us. Um, and when you combine this, again, my conclusion is that on some level, we have this ability to choose, uh, you know, free will. To me, it seems like life is a test, that, that we have to kind of choose between these competing impulses within us. And uh, it seems at least on, on some level that that, uh, that life is a test. You know, we've had on Dr. Robert Waldinger to talk about the Harvard Adult Developmental Study, and I know that's a key chapter in the book. So I'd love to segue into, you know, how does this look from purpose from a personal level, but then also what is this good for society level that is linked obviously into human nature? Because it's clear through all of this that we have thrived as humans in civilizations. It's not been on our own, completely isolated, and it's not been in small tribes trying to fight off woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. We've been able to survive and strengthen in forming civilizations. And a lot of this meaning and purpose is tied to the human nature around creating these civilizations. Yeah, and, uh, and also at, at a fundamental level are our, our immediate social groups. And when you ask people what is most meaningful about life in these large surveys that, say, the Pew Foundation does, uh, and, and you, you give them a blank answer, so it's not necessarily multiple choice, they just can write whatever they want, most people list in some form their personal relationships. And, uh, you know, I think that is... That is revealing, um, as you if you noted, you know, a lot of people will just say, well, should I just work as hard as I can, get as much money as I can? And we have, you know, there's some kind of cognitive illusions that 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 nature kind of has in a sneaky way built within us because we're not good at, you know, one of the psychological principles that, that is really interesting is, is this notion of 
affective forecasting. Okay, and that that is the ability to predict how we're going to feel in a given situation. Okay, um, and and what that means by extension is that we're not great at predicting what's going to make us happy. Let me qualify it a little bit because we're mostly good at predicting whether a situation is going to help us to feel like positive or negative emotions, but the intensity and the duration of those emotions we're, we're not great at. So, you know, this was this was driven home by a, a, an influential study in the 1970s with the provocative title of lottery winners and accident victims, where, you know, researchers, they went and they assessed these two very different groups of people, ones that had suffered uh, terrible accidents that left them quadriplegic or paraplegic, and the other group, those who had, had won the lottery. This wasn't immediately after the the uh, event of interest, but uh, some time. And so, you know, if, if I asked you, would you rather win the lottery or suffer an accident? You say, well, of course, I'm going to want to win the lottery because my happiness is going to be better, right? But the, in terms of the ability of these two different groups of people to enjoy everyday things, there wasn't really any difference. Um and and that is because and well you know it's because of a related principle called hedonic adaptation. This notion that for a lot of things, you know, after a, a, a period of time, our kind of happiness set point goes back to where it was. And and that's certainly the case with you know things like money, getting a promotion, that sort of thing. Is is yeah, they make us feel better for a period. But then we kind of settle back in. in. In a way, there's a good part about this because we also, it also means that we can adjust in the other way. And that if we go through some adverse, you know, some sort of adversity, that we can adapt and, and prove resilient and, and adjust to difficult circumstances. Um, so it's not all bad, but there is a kind of a maddening aspect to it that, that depicts us almost as like hamsters running on this like happiness treadmill. Um, but the, the, the key exception is, is relationships and that, you know, again, for good and for bad, you know, a positive, warm, intimate relationship can really increase our happiness set point. Whereas a toxic one, you don't, you don't really adapt to that. Toxic relationships kind of have this enduring negative impact on, you know, well-being. Mm -hmm. 